Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, delighted to be here, and um, uh, even more so being introduced, uh, well, previously introduced by Simon Crean. Uh, Simon and I worked very, very closely together when he was a uh, trade minister, a very dedicated uh, trade minister, and one that had a great uh, commitment and engagement with China. Uh, Simon may not remember, um, but uh, he happens to be the first ever Australian minister uh, to have met Jack Ma, the founder of Alibaba. So it shows a lot of foresight on uh, Simon's behalf. Uh, I'd like to thank also the organizers of the uh, uh, conference, Life Corp, the Australian uh, Livestock Exporters Council, and the West Australian Livestock Export Association uh, for the invitation to be here today. As Don said in his kind introduction, I've been asked to speak about preparing for success in the China market. Um, at the outset, though, I should provide something of a product warning to you. Over the past 30 years of providing policy advice and analyzing China, um, I've always been, and it's an appropriate uh, description with this group, a China bull. Sometimes I describe myself as the Pamplona economist on China. I'm running with the bull, bulls, um, and that is with respect to the Chinese economy. Uh, and it's pleased to say that um, so far, um, China has not let me down. The economic transformation of China over this time, as we all know so well, has been nothing short of extraordinary. Um, I've seen in a professional lifetime uh, a people to going from where the prize cons consumer products was a bicycle or a sewing machine for the home, where each year, at this time of the year in November, piles of cabbage just miraculously would appear in the streets and people would take it home uh, for free but that was the only green vegetable people ate for the three or four months of winter. Uh, to a China today where European cars crowd the streets, people aspire to drive Teslas, uh, where fruit and vegetables are available all year round, and again, for this audience, most importantly, people can have meat with their meal every day. It's one's immense good fortune to have been able to bear witness to all of this firsthand. But while being a China optimist, I'm not a China booster. China is not for everyone and definitely not for every business. Each business needs to work out for itself uh, if China makes sense for its business model or not. And this depends on many things, including a company or a firm's financial capacity to operate in such a big uh, country where many different regional and sub-regional markets coexist. The capacity to understand the regulatory arrangements, which can change rapidly, um, and they change without consultation and war or warning. It requires an appetite to stay the distance, to bear frustration, and particularly to devote high-level management time to the market. Accordingly, some livestock exporters, for example, are not interested in the China market. Others, however, are excited by its potential. The reason for the divergence is usually not because they are seeing different things, but because their respective business models are simply different. So it's critically important not to sleepwalk into the China market. But for those who do enter the China market with their eyes wide open, it is very important to have a solid understanding of China's politics and economy. China's political system is unlike anything we are familiar with in Australia. It is a one-party state where the Chinese Communist Party is all-powerful. In fact, it's a diarchy in which at every level, from the top of the central government to counties and villages, the state administrative bodies are matched by party organizations. But crucially, at each level, the party ranks higher than the state. That is why, a few weeks ago, when the party held its 19th Party Congress in October, so much of the world's attention was focused on that meeting. The 19th Party Congress will be seen, in my view, as a seminal event in China's history during the reform and open door period, or what is called the reform era, which began 40 years ago with the end of the Cultural Revolution. The Party Congress, which is held every five years, sets out the policy agenda for the next five years. But most importantly, it deals with leadership issues at the top level of the party and the country. It has become accepted practice that a leader will serve two five-year terms. At the end of the first term, the new leadership lineup is identified. 
It's intended that they will assume control at the end of the second five-year term. President Xi Jinping, who is the General Secretary of the Communist Party, as well as uh, Chairman of the Central Military Commission, during his first term gave many indications that he was far from a conventional Chinese political leader. At this Congress, he confirmed that view of him. He did not appoint an obvious successor, and all members of the powerful Politburo Standing Committee, which he appointed, are too old to take over the party in 2022. So speculation is now rife that she will continue to govern well beyond uh, the next five year period if he remains in good health. The significance of this is that he has now undone the process of institutionalizing the transfer of power, which had given this one party state remarkable political stability over the past 40 years. One party states usually have one of three ways to uh, make a transition of power. Uh, it can be uh, dynastically within a family, as we see in the uh, North Korea, DPRK, or Cuba. Uh, the leader can uh, uh, wait in, the, the, the leader can uh, uh, die in office, and the country can wait for that to happen whilst the economy atrophies, as in the Soviet Union. Or change can come violently, which is the most uh, common means, perhaps, as we're seeing uh, today on the streets in Zimbabwe. After the chaos of Mao's rule, then paramount leader Deng Xiaoping set about institutionalizing power by promoting collective leadership by the ruling group. So there were some checks and balances on the supreme leader. In addition, Deng also created uh, orderly and hence predictable mechanisms for transferring power. This was a major achievement by Deng and has stood China well for 30 years. Now the party congress, now after the party congress, we do not know, frankly, how power will be transferred in future. At the congress, Xi also had his thought inscribed into the party's constitution. Socialism with Chinese characteristics for a new era has now been adopted by the party as the official doctrine of Xi Jinping's rule. He is only the third leader since Mao Zedong to have his thought officially recognized by the party's constitution, but critically, only the second leader after Mao to have it taken up while still in office. Deng Xiaoping's thought uh, was only included in the party's constitution after Deng had passed away. The implication then is clear. Xi Jinping is now officially China's most powerful leader since Mao Zedong. His power is both unchallenged and, for the time being, unchallengeable. In his work report to the Congress, Xi set out two major goals. The first is that China would become, in the party's phrase, a moderately prosperous country by 2022. And this will coincide with the party's centenary, the, founding, uh, the centenary of the founding of the party. Before the Congress, Xi had already announced that China was well on its way to achieve this goal. In part, it has involved the doubling of China's 2010 GDP uh, uh, in the, since 2010, um, and the expectation is this will be done by 2019. The second goal is for China over the next 30 years to become one of the leading nations in the world, not just economically, but technologically, and in innovation, and in culture, but also militarily. The latter is a newly publicly stated aspiration for the Chinese leadership. So the work report envisages a new multipolar global order where China is one of the centers of power. Xi's doctrine of socialism with Chinese characteristics for the new era marks a significant new direction uh, for China. Deng Xiaoping's doctrine of socialism with Chinese characteristics was concerned with building China's economic strength. Its focus was on growing the Chinese economy and raising people's material living standards. Xi's doctrine goes well beyond this. It essentially declares that the tasks started by Deng are now complete, and China must, must now look beyond a single-minded focus on economic growth. Accordingly, while economic growth and material prosperity will continue to be important, the emphasis will now shift to lifting the quality of people's lives. This includes a heavy emphasis on improving the environment. For the first time, an entire section of the work report 
was devoted to the environment. In addition, more attention will be given to regulatory and health and safety standards, to reducing income inequality between rural and urban areas, and to science, technological and uh, development and innovation. While the importance of strengthening markets and continuing with economic reform is mentioned, including uh, further opening of the economy to international capital markets and trade, it is clear from the report that in the new era, this is to be state-led and driven. And the role of the party is to be strengthened in all areas, including in private firms. The tone and the emphasis of this report is, is different from what has gone uh, before and from, most, and from what most uh, analysts would have expected. If not a change of direction, it is certainly a change of gears. It marks a belief by Xi, an elite opinion in China, that China's time has come. The boldness and ambition of Xi's vision it is surprising, but it does reflect the remarkable economic development of the past two decades in which the Chinese economy has moved from an export-led to an investment-led and now to a consumption-led economic growth model. China's economy is rapidly maturing and the new policy emphasis is intended to speed this along. Both this and Xi's focus on raising the quality of life bode well for Australian exporters of goods, particularly agricultural goods and also services. China's economy is rapidly becoming both more urbanized and services based and these trends are mutually reinforcing. Over the 10 years to 2015, China's urban population rose from 42% to 56% of the total population, or by more than a quarter in just one decade. As is to be expected when per capita incomes rise toward middle income levels of development, together with large scale urbanization, the economy is becoming increasingly based on services. Services now account for 54% of GDP compared to 44% a decade ago. It's also, uh, when you're thinking about the Chinese economy, important to think about it uh, as comprising at least three major economic regions, each at different levels of development and each, accordingly, affording different commercial opportunities for exporters and investors. The coastal cities and some provinces are now at or close to developed levels of per capita income. Many of these cities are hardly known uh, or visited uh, by foreigners. Places such as Dalian, Qingdao, Yantai, Ningbo, Xiamen, Nantung, and so on, most people uh, have not heard of outside of China, but these are major commercial uh, and urban centers. Collectively, the major coastal cities have a total population of over 100 million people, or close to the entire population of Japan. They are the backbone of the consumer-led economy. It is here that a sophisticated class of consumers has emerged with high disposable incomes. These are the people demanding and who are prepared to pay premium prices for high value products, uh, not least animal protein. Between 2012 and 16, across the whole country, disposable incomes rose by 44% or to uh, over 4,000 US dollars per capita. But remember this is spread across 1.4 billion people. In view of the substantial income inequality uh, or inequality of income distribution in China, if you think about the top 30%, you're looking at some 400 million people who have developed country levels of disposable income and consumption patterns and taste. The second tier of the economy comprises the provinces running from China's northeast through central uh, China to the southeast. This, group's, this group accounts for some 700 million people. With, and they have developing country levels of income, but these are growing quickly, and the income gap between these areas and the advanced coastal areas is closing rapidly. These areas, and these, these, these people, can be expected to move increasingly towards a consumption-driven economy over the next decade. The final group is mainly in China's west, and accounts for some uh, 300 million who have a uh, still a long way to go to catch up. But it's also this group that is now currently a focus of Xi Jinping's economic policies. While the growth story is nothing short of astonishing, 
and for the economy, China's prospects seem exceedingly bright, the government does have some major challenges to overcome. Debt is the most commonly mentioned cause for concern. The growth of the past decade has been supported by a loose monetary policy that has seen total debt more than double over that decade to about 270% of GDP. Most of this um, uh, debt is non-government corporate debt, and most of this is attributable to state-owned enterprises. The absolute size of the debt, however, is not out of line with other major economies such as the US and Japan. In fact, it's less than Japan as a share of GDP. Of most concern, though, is the speed in which, at which it's accumulated, doubling over the past decade. The government's made it clear that it's seeking to slow the rate of increase and then to begin deleveraging. The jury is still out, however, on how successful this will be, especially whether the gov government will be able to deleverage sooner rather than later so as to avoid a more abrupt adjustment that would see overall economic growth slow significantly. Many economists have uh, for years been predicting a hard landing for China as a result of the need for deleveraging. While at some stage the wolf might really be at the door, the government thus far has shown it has adequate tools and skill in managing the macro economy to keep it away. The risk of a credit crunch is mitigated to a large extent by the capital account continuing to be tightly managed by the government and for the exchange rate to be set by the government. A credit crisis usually manifests itself on the external account with a surge in capital outflows and a sharp currency depreciation. Moreover, China's savings rate is still high by international standards at around 44% of GDP. Finally, in China, households are generally not uh, heavily leveraged themselves uh, and certainly nothing like in the West. This might change though, because if today's younger generation uh, has a much stronger preference for consumption over savings than their parents, and this could change as they move into adulthood. A as an anecdote, um, I have some Chinese friends who have grown up in Australia in fairly conservative Chinese families. When they've gone back to visit uh, home on holidays or their parents' home, they come back shocked um, by uh, the spending and consumption uh, of their cousins. And uh, closer to home for me, my wife's an investor in the latest newest steakhouse in China, Wolfgang's Steakhouse in Beijing. It comes from uh, Wolfgang Schweitzer's chain in uh, New York. Um, and this is a very upmarket steakhouse. The signature dish is uh, a 600-gram piece of uh, Victorian Black Angus beef. That may change now the restrictions on US beef have been lifted. Um, it costs around 240 Australian dollars for a 600 gram piece. It's sold for two people to share. The astonishing thing is not that people are buying it, but the demographic is so young. And it's nothing to go there for a lunchtime. I'm sort of under pressure to do it these days. Nothing to go there at lunchtime and see a table of young women uh, eating 600 grams of uh, Victorian Black Angus, and of course then having all the sides and extras, including red wine. This, this is changing dramatically, and I would suggest to any of you who, who are in Beijing, if you want to understand what's happening to consumption in China, go and visit Wolfgang's uh, Steakhouse in Beijing. And of course, my wife will be very happy if you do that. So uh, at the same time as, as, um, as uh, China has some sort of issues around debt, uh, there is a deeper, more structural challenge for the Chinese economy, and that's weaker productivity growth. This is attributable to a number of factors, including usual slowing of productivity growth as economies mature. An important contributor, however, is China's sclerotic financial system that is unsuited to the diversified, largely private entrepreneurial economy that has evolved in China. China's formal financial system is still dominated by state-owned banks, that have difficulty in pricing risk and prefer to lend to other state-owned enterprises, yet the state sector now only accounts for 25% of GDP. Market interest rates still do not generally allocate credit. Consequently, much investment is not going to the most efficient uses. Hence, we see overinvestment in real estate and excess capacity in certain industries, especially in heavy industry where SOEs tend to dominate. President Xi's supply-side economics uh, which was emphasized again in the Congress work report, is intended to address productivity concerns 
by promoting technological change and innovation, and at the same time cutting back on excess capacity in industries. It is, however, an administrative means of achieving stronger productivity growth rather than a market-based one. So we will need to wait to see uh, whether in the fullness of time this actually works. But notwithstanding the challenges, China's economy should continue to be able to sustain the sort of growth rates we've seen in the past five years. Lower than the average of the past 30 years, but high enough to ensure that per capita incomes will double again within the next 12 to 15 years. For the beef industry, in its various forms, demand for protein will continue to grow rapidly as per capita incomes and urbanisation both continue to increase rapidly. Australia has high brand recognition in China as a clean, green, safe source of protein. It's imperative that this image is protected. It is also important that Australian producers are branded as a lifestyle product, Australian products are branded as a lifestyle product aimed at the increasingly affluent, young, urban consumers. Trust in a brand is critical to obtaining premium prices. Competition from other foreign suppliers, of course, will only become tougher in all segments of the market. And although in the live cattle trade we enjoy uh, the advantage of proximity and therefore lower transport costs, um, Australia is a relatively high cost producer. Hence the importance of having uh, branded, uh, identified viable products in China. Chafta uh, is of considerable benefit and of course uh, uh, it helps Australia's agriculture industries very much. For example, the 10% tariff on processed beef will be removed by 2020. But some of our competitors also have their own free trade agreements and some started long before us or concluded them long before us and so they also have uh, a big advantage in the market. Another point to bear in mind is that Chinese investment in the entire value chain in Australia should be welcomed in Australia. Often the investors will be the customers and the distributors of produce from Australia back into China. Success in the China market will depend on understanding, as I mentioned at the outset, China's politics and economics, the role of the party in all manner of things, the deep structural forces that will continue to drive growth, and the regional diversity of China. It is important, too, to be alive to the regulatory risks in China. Such risks are particularly pronounced in China because the political system is still so opaque. Relationships and local partners are extremely valuable in understanding these things and in managing many of the vagaries of doing business in China and helping to mitigate risk. The hard part, of course, is choosing the right partner. Today, it's almost a cliche, but that might be because it captures an essential truth about succeeding in the China market. But it is crucial if you do decide that China is the right place for you to do business, that you prepare for the long haul with many frustrations and disappointments along the way. The good news, however, is that uh, China's urban affluent consumers, of which today there are many, and with many more to come, are quite comfortable paying premium prices for quality, trusted, branded products. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff, and um, I'd ask if uh, there are any questions. There's one over here. Um, Kirsty Forshaw, I'm a beef producer. Um, I was just wondering um, how um, in China they view we talk about um, doing business with China, but how they view doing business with us. Um, I mean, I guess it's a basic question about the foreign ownership issues. Are they um, offended by how much Australians are opposed to that? And do they see that as a risk? Um, the guy from the Australian yesterday was saying how, um, you know, what the government talked about, don't worry, we can supply you cattle, then they cut the trade off. So as far as live export cattle go, I was just interested to know how they view doing business with us and yeah, what their thoughts are that way. Uh, thanks. They, China sees um, Australia as full of enormous opportunity and potential, uh, particularly in some of the areas of closest to your hearts, protein. Uh, 
they are aware of, you know, obviously changes in uh, some of the foreign investment rules, uh, the public debate. Uh, I think all of those things, though, uh, they've become comfortable with and understand over the years. When I first went to China's ambassadors in 2007, foreign investment from China was just starting to surge into Australia, um, and there was a very strong reaction in China about the FERB, uh, lack of understanding how it operated. I think they've learnt uh, on their side. I think we have become much, much better today at explaining our rules and engaging with China at that level. I think the bigger problem is um, that uh, we're having trouble as a country coming to grips with the reality of China's size and weight in the world and its size and weight in Australia. It was always going to happen as China became richer, bigger, stronger, more prosperous and so on. I, I think it's unfortunate that we're having the, uh, the political debate about agents and influence and so on in such, a, uh, in such an excited, shrill manner. What that does and how that's perceived in China is that Australia is inherently unfriendly towards China. So it's a bit of an irony, having sort of fixed up, if you like, the formal relationship over the FERB and rules and so on, we now have this hysterical debate. There are issues to be addressed, and um, you know, the Chinese side in some cases have behaved stupidly. Um, but it all needs to be kept in proportion and context. But, but the hysteria is very unhelpful because it does leave, lead to a view in China that I think is quite widely felt um, that Australia is inherently unfriendly towards China. So that's got potentially big issues because Australia has a very big source of, um, it's very big and important destination for Chinese students studying overseas and for tourists. So all these things can uh, intersect and could be uh, quite costly to Australia if we don't manage these things. It's in our right and we should make sure that uh, we're comfortable with what people are doing in, in Australia, but at the same time, it needs to be managed in a way where it doesn't become hysterical and can then um, uh, create an image and a sense in China that Australia is not a good, good place to be. How do you propose to uh, manage the public debate about foreign investment in relation to China or even uh, manage media? Uh, that sounds like what you're referring to, uh, managing the message that goes back. How do you propose we do that? Well, uh, look, I, I think uh, we need um, political leadership around this issue. We need um, corporate leadership. Um, I think it's important that, uh, that there's a debate about uh, behavior of um, uh, Chinese government, um, uh, or Chinese, in, uh, Chinese engagement in campuses via Chinese government uh, representatives, we, we need to understand the facts and, w and we need campuses uh, to, to look at that. But uh, really it's a case of getting, to, I think, quite clear messages from corporate and political leaders that uh, Chinese investment is welcome, Chinese students, Chinese tourists are welcome, um, and the rest of us can help explain to the Chinese about uh, the way the Australian media operates and help them understand the context in which this discussion is taking place. Hi, Kim Haywood, WA Farmers. Really interested about your comments about branding beef as a lifestyle product. What are the key factors around that brand concept that you think we should really capture? and take forward? Well, in a sense, it's already there. It's, it's, it's the you know, clean, green, safe brand that Australia has almost generically. Um, but um, uh, it can be packaged with uh, uh, you know, lifestyle, lifestyle images. Uh, it can be packaged with um, uh, health-related images. Uh, but it's very, very important that we as a country do nothing that in any way undermines that uh, perception of Australia as clean, green, safe. And then we need to build on that and add more um, images and, and, and lifestyle uh, uh, presentations around it. We've the, this, this, this emerging, or has emerged, big group of young demographic, um, high uh, affluent consumers 
um, they really want to buy experience. So whereas you know, a decade ago or more when I first went to China, you know, there was Louis Vuitton handbags and so on, um, today people want handbags where no one knows the name because that must make it more interesting. So things are, you know, needs to be much more experience based. That's why look, there's, there's a potential boom for Australia linking you know, tourism, our, our quality foods, our capacity to supply protein um, and into a big experience. And I think that's where we need to be putting uh, our effort. I can hurdle one more. Thanks, Don. Jeff Cameron Hall, nice to see you again. Thanks for your address. Um, two questions, if I may. One, uh, your view on the importance of getting the right partner in China to do business with and, and the best way about doing that. The second one, you spoke in your, in your address a bit around how quickly regulations can change in China. How do people building um, an agricultural supply chain in Australia manage that risk? Because that risk of change can decimate profitability very quickly. Yeah, look, on, on the first one, it's a perennial and there is no easy answer. Uh, basically, you need to be on the ground and meet people and, um, and, and, uh, and also don't be, don't be just focused on Shanghai or Shenzhen or something, but recognise the diversity of the place. But it's really, you have to do it through per building personal relationships and that does take time. So there's no silver bullet on getting the right partner. On the, on the regulatory risk, on one hand, there's nothing much you can do about it and it's a risk factor uh, that really needs to be acknowledged. But there is something to be very careful about and that is because things are changing so much, say in the area of uh, e-commerce, um, a lot of regulations haven't caught up with the reality of um, how business is being conducted. And you, know, you can think of it as a grey area. But anywhere that is lightly regulated or where there's a sense that regulation is not caught up um, uh, with the reality of how trade is conducted, you need to be very, very careful because for sure the regulations will catch up. And I think we saw that with what, the Balamese or Blackmores. Um, uh, it's a classic case. Uh, oh, you see a huge, huge rent because it's likely regu regulated. You rush in, do business in that space, and then wake up one morning and there's a notice in the newspaper and you're regulated and the rents are suddenly gone. So you need to be careful about that. But I think um, uh, if you're, if, if, if you're uh, operating in well-established areas um, where trade's been going on for, for some time, then um, the regulatory risk is much less, but it is something that you always need to, to factor into your, your business model.